Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. Last time we completed the City in the Sky and retrieved the final fragment of the Mirror of Twilight, meaning we can now reassemble it. Strangely, even though this is the game's penultimate dungeon, this is also the dungeon with the least amount of questing and story stuff to do leading up to it. We literally just have to warp back to the Mirror Chamber, watch a cutscene, and enter the dungeon. Easy. I guess I'm fine with that, considering how much there was to do before the City in the Sky, but still, something does feel a bit off to me about this. I have to wonder if there was some cut quest line that we didn't get here, because the pacing just feels so abrupt this time. Not to complain too much though. I love the dungeons in this game, but there needs to be some breathing room between them, and while I think that the pre-dungeon stuff for City in the Sky maybe went a bit overboard with it, this time it feels like it leans too far in the opposite direction. You can easily spend less than 5 minutes between these dungeons. That said, we also have a fully loaded out inventory now, so this is a great opportunity to complete any side quests that you want to catch up on, including Poe collecting gathering any remaining heart pieces, and one of my favorites, the gauntlet of a mini dungeon, the Cave of Ordeals. This plays out similar to the Savage Labyrinth from Wind Waker, except that it's entirely optional this time around. This puts you against wave after wave of enemies, lasting 50 floors, and some of these battles are pretty tricky. You'll have to pull out all the stops and use your best combat abilities just to make it through here. That stuff aside, as previously mentioned, to get to the actual dungeon, we simply need to warp back to the mirror chamber. We get a nice cutscene with the mirror reassembling, and we can open the portal to the Twilight Realm. The sages appear, and we have a nice chat with them, and Midna finally revealing her true identity. She is the titular Twilight Princess, the true ruler of the Twilight Realm that Zant usurped. With that, it's now time to infiltrate and retake her home from Zant, so we can use this portal and we'll be warped into the Twilight Realm. Welcome to the Palace of Twilight. This is an interesting dungeon. Coming off the heels of City in the Sky, which was the game's longest dungeon, this is, ironically, the shortest and most straightforward dungeon in the game. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing to talk about here. Where it lacks in navigational difficulty, it makes up for in terms of ambience, lore, and individual challenges. Similar to City in the Sky, the palace is actually divided into to a handful of segmented pods, or buildings, that are basically all isolated from each other. So in terms of interconnectivity, this dungeon is lacking. It compensates by having hordes and hordes of enemies, obstacle course-like platforming, and some clear objectives that, while being understandable, will test your skills under pressure. The dungeon rarely will put a key in a room outside of where it's used, and and so finding those keys to the various locked doors isn't so much a matter of exploration, so much as it is about completing whatever challenge is in that room in order to get that chest with said key to appear. That challenge usually boiling down to just defeating all the enemies. On paper, that doesn't really sound like a dungeon that I'd enjoy. I've criticized other dungeons for exactly that, but the Palace of Twilight has such an interesting, palpable sense of 
of tension, ambience, and danger that an otherwise dull concept ends up being a challenging and interesting dungeon, like infiltrating an enemy fortress. There are some moments here that genuinely get the adrenaline running. The whole structure of this dungeon can be boiled down to three objectives. The two side buildings will see us completing these gauntlets of challenges and retrieving these orbs called souls. We then have to complete the gauntlet in reverse while carrying these souls back. Not unlike the Temple of Time dungeon earlier with our statue buddy, except it's twice and on a much smaller scale. Our return trips will see this giant creepy stone hand pursuing us and attempting to reclaim the orbs. While we have to retread the same rooms over again while taking these paths in reverse, each room has to be approached differently the second time around, using these souls to interact with various mechanisms and solving different puzzles to be able to safely transport it. Having to do this under the pressure of this slow pursuit makes for that aforementioned palpable sense of tension, and that music cue that plays when the hand gets close just makes my heart race. Once we've retrieved both orbs, that final objective is simply a matter of heading straight for the boss at the top of the central building. Sounds simple enough, but of course there are tons of enemies and contraptions along the way to hinder our progress. From a visual and architectural standpoint, this might be one of my favorite dungeons in the series. There's something about the line art, the detailed flagstone, and the glowing lines of energy that I just find to be visually stunning. It wonderfully straddles that line of being both highly detailed, but not too overly busy. The simple, angular, geometrical shapes of the buildings made from this dark stone just feel imposing, and the backdrop of twilight over this place, paired with these cascades of dark fog made up of shadow crystals, just has this otherworldly, ethereal feeling that is so unlike anything else in this series. The Zelda series has its fair share of parallel worlds and dimensional shifts, but none of them quite capture that dark, ethereal, otherworldly feel like the Twilight Realm does. And just like City in the Sky did, here we have an impressive sense of scale, with these huge buildings looming over us and even other floating towers visible in the distance. The interiors of these buildings are just as interesting. There's a really cold feeling feeling about this place, and all the enemies have a cohesive design that goes along with the buildings themselves, making Link feel so especially out of place here as an outsider. Overall, there is a lot of this uncomfortable, uncanny valley feeling with the layouts here, where City in the Sky had a minimalist, clean, and usually very symmetrical art deco architectural style. Everything here is just slightly off, like the architecture is somewhat skewed. Everything is mostly symmetrical, but always slightly off. Whether it be disruptions in the designs and shapes of the floor tiles, the glowing patterns all over the place, or the shapes of the rooms themselves, it's always close to being symmetrical, but just not quite, adding to that feeling of discomfort as our expectations are disrupted. I can't stress enough how visually interesting this place really is. Glowing energy lines like this are featured heavily in many places throughout the series, such as the statues in the Temple of Time, the Tower of the Gods in Wind Waker, or most recently in the Sheikah technology of Breath of the Wild. And it works well in all these settings, but pairing the glowing light with such dark stonework set over the backdrop of the ethereal twilight just enhances and highlights this glowing energy even more. One of the most fascinating aspects of the dungeon is the symbolism and iconography, which often stands out due to that glowing energy. The symbol on the map screen, as well as on all of the doors, seems to be a modified and rotated version of the symbol for the Dominion Rod, which we saw back in both the Temple of Time and City in the Sky. This huge stylized emblem, which is all over the place, also seems to have a version of this symbol. But but stylized to fit with the look of the Twilight Magic. And strangely, the squared off swirling patterns that we saw present in the City in the Sky, as well as Minish Cap's Palace of Winds, shows up 
prominently here as well. They are also present on the portal that sends us here. What this means in terms of lore is a bit vague. We learned earlier in the game from the Light Spirit Laneru, as well as from Midna herself, that the Twilight people were considered dark interlopers who were banished to the Twilight Realm after some ancient conflict over the Triforce, meaning this tribe of people that Midna is descended from once dwelled in the light of Hyrule in ancient times. There are a lot of theories surrounding the origins of these people, so I might as well take a stab at it too. First thing to note, the appearance of the Twilight People is likely a side effect of exposure. These people once dwelled in the Light World originally before being banished to the Twilight Realm. After generations of exposure to the atmosphere here, they must have transformed into what we see now, which is a race that can only exist as shadows in the Light World. But that wasn't always the case. Some believe, based on the appearance of their magic and iconography, that they were an offshoot of Sheikah insurrectionists. A modified Sheikah eye is even present on the throne here, as well as on the back of Midna's fused shadow helm. These orbs, called souls, also seem to act as power sources, and can be fitted into these slots to activate various mechanisms. At the time, this was a pretty unique concept, but this same function of fitting orbs into slots to activate technology featuring glowing lines of energy does come up again in the series, that being in the Sheikah Shrines of Breath of the Wild. This glowing energy is persistent everywhere in the twilight, taking on a light teal color here. But any mechanism that is either corrupted or under Zant's control instead glows with red energy. Of course, Zant got his power from Ganondorf, and later on in Breath of the Wild, when Calamity Ganon corrupts and takes control of the Sheikah technology, the glowing energy changes from blue to red. So there is a lot of evidence to connect the twilight to the Sheikah, who were also known as Shadow Folk. However, the speculation doesn't end there. Some believe the Twilight to be a banished sect of Gerudo people, since the site of their banishment and location of the Mirror of Twilight is found in the Gerudo Desert at the top of a former Gerudo building, the Arbiter's Grounds. And given the absence of the Gerudo people in this game, this theory holds some weight as well, especially considering some of the symbols found in Arbiter's Grounds are somewhat similar to these found in the Palace of Twilight. These swirling flagstone patterns on the floors and walkways also remind me of the floor pattern at the top of Ganon's tower in Wind Waker, which also sat in the desert. Of course, the pattern isn't identical, but there is some clear similarity in my opinion. Zant even has a heavily stylized Gerudo symbol on his robes, which sort of reminds me of the stylized symbol that Ganondorf wore in the Wind Waker. Now, some might dismiss this, since Zant is a follower of Ganondorf, sure, but even in this cutscene taking place before Zant ever encountered the King of Gerudo, he already wore this robe with this symbol on it. It's also worth pointing out that a lot of the architecture and iconography here shares similarities with the mysterious Zonai tribe of Breath of the Wild. Very little is actually known about the Zonai, but they're said to be a race of magic-wielding barbarians who vanished suddenly sometime in the distant past. And these squared-off swirling patterns and serpentine motifs in these structures are not a bad fit. Furthermore, this symbol found on the buckles of the barbarian set sure bear a resemblance to these circular patterns found around the palace here. So where do I sit on these theories? Well, something worth noting is that earlier cutscene with Laneru describing the dark interlopers. The cutscene is fairly metaphorical in nature, so it's a bit open to interpretation, but when it describes the interlopers, it shows three figures three shadow figures resembling Darklink, who is representative of a dark reflection of ourselves. But then one of them is changed to resemble Link, as we know him in the game. To me, this implies one thing. The interlopers could be anyone. Not just one single tribe that was banished, but more likely a conglomerate of races. Anybody who was vying for power in this war for control over the Triforce, 
were all banished and eventually evolved into the Twilight. Some may view this as a cop-out theory, but it makes the most sense to me. If we were to narrow it down to one singular tribe, it would mean outright ignoring evidence that points to another, and vice versa. But if the Twilight were comprised of multiple races who, after generations of intermingling and exposure to the atmosphere of the Twilight Realm, all formed to be one race of shadow people, this would be the cleanest and simplest explanation. It's worth noting as well that when Twilight covers the land of Hyrule, creatures like Dekubabas, Kargoroks, Keese, and Bulblins are all transformed into shadow versions of their species, all sharing a cohesive look. So there's nothing to say that living in this realm for long enough wouldn't transform any and all humanoid races like Sheikah, Gerudo, or even Hylians who took part in this conflict into one singular race. The Twilight people. A counterpoint to this might be that when Twilight covers Hyrule, its denizens are transformed into spirits, not shadow versions of Hylians, Gorons, or Zoras. But there may be an explanation for this as well. Consider this. Midna states earlier that the magic curse that bound Link to his wolf form, manifested as a shadow crystal, is different from her tribe's normal magic. During the first act of the game, whenever entering this Twilight, Link is transformed into a wolf, and then again when cursed by Zant directly. But when entering the Twilight Realm, this transformation is not triggered unless Link comes into contact with this dark fog, which Midna states is composed of tiny floating shadow crystals. What this implies to me is that the veil of Twilight covering Hyrule earlier in the game is not the same as the Twilight that is ever persistent in the Twilight Realm, but rather a dark twisted variation of it. The latter would allow creatures to dwell here without becoming a spirit, whereas the former is Zant's magic being bolstered by Ganondorf. So that's my belief. The Interloper War is one that we know very little about, but the tribe of shadow magic users may have only become one singular tribe after finding themselves sharing a home in exile here in the Twilight Realm. These Interlopers could have been anyone, not just from one race, but rather appearing among all the denizens of Hyrule, only to be banished. The music here comes in two separate tracks, one for the outdoor sections of the palace, and one for the palace interior. The outdoor theme has a simple, repeating synth section layered over top what sounds like a tune from a music box, this being the Twilight Realm, makes this very fitting. It straddles that line of feeling comforting, but also somewhat dangerous. Of course, this is Midna's corrupted home, so that mixing of tones is perfect. I've mentioned several times the otherworldly and ethereal feeling of this place, and just as I praised City in the Sky's music for so perfectly capturing the mood of that dungeon, I will also praise this piece. There is something so somber and ethereal about this music that fits here so Perfectly, it's masterfully done. The interior section is a bit more low-key, but amps up the tension more. There's more bell and chime sounds rather than the music box melody, and something of a sinister undertone, especially when you get to these sections where it sounds like someone dramatically banging on a harpsichord. There's one prominent instrument which I can't quite place in my head, but it carries most of this interior piece. Interestingly, the same instrument was used back in Arbiter's Grounds, as well as in the theme for Ganon's Tower in Wind Waker, further drawing in the ties between these locations. Arbiter's Grounds being where the mirror was located, and of course Ganondorf's influence over Zant tying into this place. Have a listen.
It's worth noting that the music here shares a lot of its instrumentation with the music when the Twilight is covering Hyrule, but that track in comparison feels broken, fragmented, and incomplete, whereas here the track feels more whole and rounded out, which makes sense to me, as the Twilight covering Hyrule was like a veil layered over the land, rather than here where it's ever persistent and at home. This is where the Twilight belongs, and the music reflects that. One final note about the music here, the usual string and brass combat music that plays during enemy encounters is swapped out for the same synth-heavy combat music that plays in the Twilight in Hyrule earlier in the game. Considering the usual bombastic score of Zelda games that heavily feature your typical strings, brass, and piano, the heavy use of synth for the Twilight really sets this apart and reinforces that otherworldly feel. I think it's a brilliant choice. Alright, enough about that, let's go over the progression. When we enter the dungeon, we'll be dropped into this central courtyard area. Right away, we'll see what looks to be shadow beasts, but Midna will ask us not to attack them, noting that these are actually Twilight people that have been transformed by Zant, therefore not enemies. Remember that. At a glance, there's three paths from here leading to the three sections of the dungeon. However, the eastern path is inaccessible thanks to an impassable gap, and a flow of dark fog blocks the northern path, so the western building is the only place to start. Inside here are two short hallways. Both have locked doors at the end, so it's a matter of defeating all the enemies in each room in order to trigger the chest containing the key to appear. The enemies range from keys to babas to these giant zant masks, and yes, that's what they're called, which we can defeat by reflecting their attacks back at them to stun them and then striking. Easy enough. The second room has this dark fog, forcing us to use wolf form here to fight them as well. We'll also find the compass here. It always feels weird to me finding the compass before the map, but considering the swaths of hidden optional treasure chests in this dungeon, I suppose they just wanted to get it in the player's hands as soon as possible. At the end of these hallways, we'll find a stone hand clutching the first soul. But as we approach it, barriers will drop around us, and an apparition of Zant will appear, initiating the mid-boss fight. Sorta. This is Phantom Zant, and Phantom Ganon he is not. He'll use these blasts of dark energy to open these portals, calling swarms of enemies into the arena. As he does this, he'll also teleport around the room in order to avoid us. The fight itself is pretty simple. He'll do his best to evade us, and while he's actually casting his dark magic, he'll momentarily be vulnerable to attack. So that's the moment to strike. You'll need to do so with your sword, as he'll avoid any long-range attacks. You don't have to worry too much about the minor enemies he summons in. Your main focus is gunning for him while he's open to attack. Easy enough. Keep at him enough, and he'll explode into a cloud of that dark fog, ending the battle. Now we can strike that stone hand and retrieve the soul. The light of the soul will dissipate the fog, revealing a slot in the floor that the orb can fit into. This activates the stairs in the floor so that we can reach the door again. However, the hand, which is called a Zant's hand, real creative with the naming scheme here, will also awaken and start to pursue you right away. If at any point the hand catches up to you, it will try to grab the soul. You can always strike it to stun it or get it to drop the orb, so keep that in mind so that he doesn't get away and set you back. Anyways, you can use the claw shots to pull the soul over to you at the top of the stairs and head into the previous room. 
There's another slot for the orb in the floor here to activate these stairs so that you can make your way up to the second floor balcony of this room and then hop back down to the door. Now for that first room with the sloped floor again. As a side note, there's an alcove behind this flow of dark fog that hides a treasure chest with a piece of heart. So may as well nab this while we're here. Bring the orb back to the central courtyard and we'll see that it has the effect of reverting these transformed twilight people back to their normal selves. Great. If you try to take the soul down the north path, Midna will actually stop you, saying that it would be dangerous to take it that way, so instead we can place it in one of these slots in the floor of the courtyard. This will activate a moving platform that we can ride over that gap and reach the eastern building. Alright, it's the same idea here. We need to cross these hallways, defeating the enemies as we go, so that we can get those chests with keys to appear. These hallways in particular make good use of the claw shots and hide lots of optional chests in alcoves, including another piece of heart, so it's worth being thorough. We'll find the dungeon map in here as well. We'll reach another room with one of these hands clutching a soul, and we'll have a rematch with Phantom Zant. So you can look at this as either a second mid-boss fight, or even just as the mid-boss being fought halfway in each section. The method of defeating him is the same here, so we won't dwell on it. All right. So once again, we'll nab the soul, use it to raise some stairs, and take it with us back to the central courtyard. These rooms in the eastern building are a little more tricky than their western counterparts, as there's some tougher enemies and trickier platforming involved, but as long as you remember that you can snatch the soul with the claw shots, or use arrows to stun the Zant's hand, then you should be able to make it through here just fine. Okay, with the two orbs now placed in their slots here, the power of those souls will actually transform transfer over to the Master Sword, allowing it to cut through and dissipate the dark fog, just like the light from the souls could. I guess you could look at this power-up as being the dungeon item in a way. Shiny. This will give us access to the northern building as we can cut through the waterfall of dark fog blocking the path. Inside this first room, we'll need to make our way upstairs. We can cut through the fog to find these two slots, which we can toss these two orbs into, raising these stairs. Then activate these orbs using the light from our sword to manifest some floating platforms, and don't forget to kill the baddies and get the key we need along the way. Spending that key takes us onto this large balcony. Again, we'll need to kill all the baddies out here, including some that are tucked off on another ledge, to get that chest containing a small key to appear. Behind this dark waterfall, there's also some platforms we can make our way to using the claw shots, where we'll also nab ourselves the boss key. All right, spending that small key takes us back inside. There's a series of floating platforms here that we can ride to ascend up this large vertical room. Along the way, there's another treasure chest with a small key, which as usual, will appear after defeating all the enemies. And once we've reached the top, we can spend that small key, taking us into this hallway with the boss door. But first, there's a short combat challenge, which will pit us against several waves of shadow beasts, which I guess Midna no longer has issue with us killing. A well-timed spin attack will dispatch them with ease, so even though there are well over a dozen of these guys in total, they should be a piece of cake. Alright, with that out of the way, we can finally head into the boss room. The boss room is also the throne room of the palace, and upon that throne sits Zant, the usurper king. Midna goads him a bit, and so he gives us a Zant rant about oppression, his desire for power, and how Ganondorf, who he sees as a god, granted him his power. That's all well and good, but as it turns out, Zant here is a bit of a lunatic, so it's time to whoop his butt. The battle plays out as a bit of a boss rush, or as a review of previous battles. He'll warp us into areas of past bosses and mid-bosses, and the method of fighting him will reflect how we fought that previous boss. Of all boss battles in this game, this has got to be the one with the most phases to one single battle, and it's kind of awesome, as Zant, who believes himself to be truly powerful, will get noticeably more flustered and frustrated as the fight goes on, and his his facade of being this stoic, calculated powerhouse slowly falls apart. 
Just a quick mention about the music, as I usually do. As we transition between arenas, the music will also evolve. There's one consistent underlying theme at all times throughout the fight, but there's these little accents sampled from those previous battle themes sprinkled into the music at the appropriate times. Additionally, a single note plays as Zant opens the portal and changes the arena, which is the first note in the Twilight Over Hyrule theme. Mixing these samples into the battle music is super fitting, but also just shows the care and attention to detail put into this game's soundtrack. I love it. The first phase takes us back to the Force Temple with the Diababa themed battle. He'll continuously try to blast us with energy bolts, but you can stun him with the boomerang and then strike him while he's down. The next phase takes us to the Goron Mines, themed after the fight against Dang Goro. Use the Iron Boots to keep your footing as he knocks the arena around and block his attacks with your shield. Eventually, he'll tire himself out, leaving himself vulnerable to attack, so go nuts on him. The next phase takes us back to Lake Bed Temple, in the arena of Morpheal. Xant will do a sort of whack-a-mole hide-and-seek sort of thing with several giant helmets. They'll each open up and he'll try to attack you, so swim close enough to yank him out of his protective helmet with the claw shot and give him a beating. The fourth phase actually takes us back to the Forest Temple, themed after the battle against Ook. Just like we did then, wait for him to stop poised atop one of these pillars, then roll into the totem pole to knock him to the ground, and hit him while he's grounded. Easy. The penultimate phase here is themed after the Blizzetta fight from Snowpeak Ruins. Zant will grow to an enormous size, but you can use the ball and chain to just whack his foot, causing him to shrink back down to normal size, leaving him open to attack. I love this animation as he hops around clutching his foot like this, it genuinely makes me chuckle. But also really feeds into this idea of his facade of power unraveling. Alright, the final phase of the battle drops us into central Hyrule Field. Rather than a battle modeled after a previous fight, this time it's a one-on-one -on -one sword duel with Zant. And it's personal. Zant wheels a pair of scimitars and employs some rather unorthodox combat techniques. Be persistent, use your shield often, and you should be able to break through his defenses to deal some damage. This is probably my favorite phase of the battle, as he just tries to go absolutely ham on you. But Link has grown so strong at this point that Zant, who previously threw us around like a ragdoll, is kind of a pushover, and it almost feels like Zant's frustration has grown to a boiling point, like a child throwing a tantrum here. Again, as I mentioned before, it's his facade of being this powerful being crumbling apart. Keep at him, and eventually he'll go down. We'll find ourselves back in the throne room with Zant subdued. But he insists that his death won't stick, certain that Ganon will revive him. He provokes Midna, saying that the curse on her can't ever be broken, meaning she will never be able to rule the Twilight Realm again. This of course aggravates her, and using the power of the recovered fused shadows, she lashes out at him, and oh boy, she literally pops that man like a balloon. She exploded him all the way dead. Damn Midna, that's cold. As usual, we'll get our heart container, and Midna will reaffirm our next course of action, to confront Ganondorf and rescue Zelda. So that's the dungeon. In terms of navigation, this has got to be the most straightforward dungeon in the game. Unlike most of the previous dungeons which featured sprawling openness and interconnectivity, this place is segmented, isolated, even more so than City in the Sky was, and features almost no crisscrossing or zigzagging around the dungeon. But it compensates for that straightforward navigation with combat challenges at every turn, with a retrieval mission that has the tension dialed up all the way, and enemies and obstacles that attempt to constantly hinder your progress. The challenges here aren't about where to go next, it's instead about testing your skills while doing so. While this might not be everyone's cup of tea, you can't deny that they had a clear objective in mind with this dungeon and that it's executed pretty well. But the biggest selling point of this dungeon for me is that moody atmosphere, that sense of danger, that otherworldly ethereal ambience and architecture, and that sense of being an outsider infiltrating this imposing stronghold. The entire vibe of this place is so fascinating and visually 
a spectacle to behold. I love this enveloping sense of cold darkness, with only the faint lines of glowing energy lighting these rooms. The entire look of it is just so incredible. There's also a certain somberness knowing that, as Midna told us, this was once a serene place where its denizens could live out their days peacefully but now it sits corrupted by the influence of a power-hungry usurper. The Twilight are such an enigmatic race of people that we see so little of, only catching a glimpse of their civilization here. But with so little, we have so much to talk about even still. So much so that fans have been begging for the Twilight to return at some point, any point in the series. So for me, I have mixed feelings about this one. I feel that based on its placement this late in the game and for what it represents, sense for Midna as a character, that the dungeon should be more complex and challenging. But I also see what they were going for, with a gauntlet of challenges to overcome as we make our approach to confront Sant. Thinking of it logically like that, I should really not like this dungeon. But when I'm actually playing it, I'm so pulled in by the aesthetic ambience and the overall mood of this place that I just can't help but adore it. They could have gone further with it, sure, but I still like this dungeon a lot. Thank you so much for watching this video, I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you to the lovely people who support me on Patreon as well as my channel members, in particular those who supported at the cheese tier or higher, which includes Tetra, Brenda, Justin, Callie, Finley, Grey Mage, Hylian Historian, Gale, Ethan3G, and Clifford. Thank you so much for the support you guys, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye! <laughs>